Right, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. I'd ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so they do not affect the committee's work. We have apologies this morning from the convener, Jenny Mara, and from Colin Beatty. And I'd like to welcome David Stewart and Angela Constance to the meeting who are attending in their place. Item one on our agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items four and five in private? Yep. Thank you. Uh, item two on our agenda is a section 22 report, the 2017-18 audit of the Scottish Police Authority. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Assistant Director, and Pauline Gillen, Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. I'd like to, at this stage, invite the Auditor General to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This is the fifth time I've presented a Section 22 report to the Committee on the Annual Audit of the Scottish Police Authority. This year, the Auditor has given an unqualified opinion on the annual report and accounts, and there have been improvements in several key areas. Many of the concerns that I've highlighted to the Committee in the past have been addressed. In particular, I welcome progress in the SPA's leadership, governance and financial management. Significant challenges remain, but the SPA is now better placed to address them than at any time in the past. Although financial management has improved, there's still a major financial challenge in both the short term and the long term. The SPA is still operating with a deficit in its revenue expenditure. In 2017-18, that deficit was £37.9 million, money which had to be found from elsewhere in the Scottish Government's budget. The SPA plans to return to a balanced budget by 2021, but its 10-year financial strategy suggests it will return to a deficit position after that unless it changes its operating model. That change is also central to achieving the ambitions in policing 2026. The estates and workforce strategies will be critical in changing how the service operates in future, but there's been insufficient progress in developing them so far. Modernising the police service's IT system is also essential. The SPA has now agreed a data, digital and ICT strategy, but it isn't clear how the estimated £290 million cost will be funded. My report details an increase in external support costs during 2017-18. This reflects the scale of transformation that the SPA and Police Scotland seek to achieve, and a recognition that they don't yet have the skills and experience required. It's critical, however, that that expenditure on external support is closely monitored, the intended benefits are realised, and a transfer of knowledge achieved. Finally, I note in my report the uncertainty with how railway policing will be devolved to Scotland. I am concerned that unless this uncertainty is resolved, there is a risk that, that it will distract attention from the wider transformation agenda. In summary, convener, there's been considerable progress and there are still some significant challenges to address. We'll do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the committee session with David Stewart, please. Right. Uh, good morning, and thank you for your evidence today. Um, could I raise the issue about uh, consultancy uh, fees, which you mentioned in your Section 22 report? As you point out, there's been a considerable jump uh, in these fees. Uh, in your view, does this represent good value for money? I think it's too, so, too soon for me to conclude that it's good value for money, but I do recognise that um, both the scale of the transformation that the S SPA and Police Scotland are seeking to achieve and the fact that they're still building their capacity and that there are some really specialist skills in these areas mean that it's appropriate to bring in external support where that's required. Mm. Um, what's really important, I think, is that they um, monitor the expenditure carefully, they make sure they're getting the benefits that they expected and that they are achieving that transfer of knowledge into the organisation, mm. so they're building their capacity for the future. And not for the first time you've predicted my next question, which is the strength of internal monitoring. Obviously, you've had a view in the Section 22 report, but do you believe that within the organisations there is strong systems for monitoring and evaluation? I'll ask Pauline Gillen to talk you through what she sees um, in her role as the audit manager. Thank you. Um, in the past, in our audit reports, we have noted that there has, has been a lack of skills and capacity in the finance function of SPA and Police Scotland. Um, by bringing in additional resources, the finance function has been strengthened, and we have reported during 2017-18 that we have evidence of that strengthening of overall budget control and monitoring and management. 
we will continu continue um, in 2018-19 to review that to ensure that all the additional consultancy contracts that have been awarded are being appropriately monitored and managed. Right. And obviously, moving on to sort of related area, you also mentioned the the burden because of the number and costs of procurement and, and finance. I mean, to what extent do you believe um, that some of that could be brought in house, or is there more room for developing procurement and finance in house? Um, as far as I understand, there are intentions to strengthen the internal capacity in terms of procurement. Right. So, having permanent internal staff who are who are um, in charge of procurement, yes. So in very, in very general terms, and I make a sort of probably sweeping generalisation, uh, but there, there's obviously an opportunity cost here. Uh, so in other words, spending on consultancy um, can be converted into having permanent staff, which tends to be a lot cheaper on the long run. Is that, is that a reasonable assessment to make in, as a generalisation on that fact? Yes, it is. And we would expect in the medium to long term that the expenditure on external support would decrease as internally the capacity and skills strengthen. Right. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Bowman. If I could just <coughs> excuse me, follow up on that a little bit. Um, it, we have your report here, but supporting that is the Audit Scotland annual audit report and in that you have a section called significant findings in the audit of the financial statements and there are six items and some of these are uh, I would say quite serious that there was an unadjusted error of 2.6 million in one area board member expense claims about supporting um, documentation and also agency staff disclosure which I think is what we're right. speaking about here and this was an adjustment I think you forced because they had um, sort of concealed this away in staff and um, staff costs as opposed to actually being put into agency costs. And this is an area obviously of interest to the, to the committee, but had you not done your audit, we would never have seen this. Can you I'll give us some comment on what went on there? Certainly, I'll ask Stephen to talk you through that, through that as the audit director. Um, good morning. Certainly. Our analysis of the disclosures and accounts is a key part of our roles and responsibilities. Um, we pay particularly close attention to um, consultancy costs, agency costs and how they're categorised. As Pauline mentions, I think particularly for, for next year, um, the SPA have recognised that you know, they need to strengthen their arrangements and we'll now see from, it's now already in place, that the, new, the Chief Finance Officer for the S for Police Scotland is now overseeing procurement. We think that's a good step. It gives a, an increased rigour to the overall arrangements, but particular increased focus on how that's captured in the annual report and accounts. I think in, by way of the, the, the audit adjustment, absolutely right, it is a, it's a key part of our role to take a view on the adequacy of the disclosures. What's not in doubt is the quantum of the sum. It was really just the split between whether these were agency or consultancy, and our work led us to the uh, assessment that these were better categorised um, as consultancy and, and hence the change in the disclosure. Perhaps for once, uh, I'm not actually <laughs> concerned about what, what you found. It's more the underlying situation here that we have a, a body that's not capable of um, analysing out key numbers and that you have to come along and find them and tell them to do it. I think we would say that the, the quality and capacity of the finance department has increased significantly uh, during the past year. The committee has previously heard about doubts about the financial capacity and capability of, of the finance team and its own use of considerable amounts of consultancy support. In the past 12 months, they've gone through um, large-scale recruitment programmes, recruited um, quality finance professionals. So I think what we'll see is really probably this just the tail of, of legacy um, arrangements, the quantum and the scale of issues that we encountered during the audit of the financial statements were significantly reduced this year. So uh, what we'd expect to see when we come back to do 2018 and any further uh, reporting to the committee is an ongoing reduction in the extent of uh, audit issues that we encounter during the financial statements work. Okay, thank you, Convener. I think the number of these significant adjustments should give us cause to discuss perhaps later. Thank you, Bill Bowen. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, Auditor General. I'm pleased to hear what you said in your opening remarks about the, where the improvements have been seen in leadership, governance and financial management, and that's to be welcome. But I wanted to ask you about the ICT section of your report in paragraph 12, and I wonder if you could tell us a wee bit more about uh, um, the experience uh, of the previous committee on the I6 project. 
I think the estimate for the delivery of that was about £46 million, but we're reading today that this one is estimated to be about £298 million, which is a significantly bigger number than before. So could you give us some kind of indication of what we're getting for that or hoping to get for that kind of investment, please? Um, I'll ask Stephen to come in in a moment, but I think the first thing um, to say is that we have recognised from the beginning that Police Scotland would need to make a significant investment in IT, um, not just to bring together the legacy systems of the eight predecessor forces, which were all creaking a bit themselves, but really to take that step forward to enable policing to be delivered in a new way for the 21st century, responding to what technology can do, but also to the differing um, sort of shape and, and feel of crime across the country. Um, and I'm pleased to see that there is now a comprehensive digital data and IT strategy for taking that forward. And you're right, nearly £300 million is a very significant sum. Stephen, can you say a bit more about the content of the strategy and why it's looking that expensive at this stage? Of course. Um, I think history is important. As the committee knows, there, there hasn't been much investment um, in IT within Police Scotland after many, many years. A larger reflection of the quantum, the sum that's been put forward, is a reflection of really that uh, delay in making progress in, in the early years of the, the National Police Service. In terms of the components, what in developing the strategy and uh, in arriving at the number and, and, and the, the proposed way forward, it's broken down across a range of um, requirements. Some of that is you know, uh, mobile technology solutions for officers when they're out in the um, in communities, other is back office um, solutions. Um, and what Police Scotland have been really clear in, in developing the strategy is that there's a sense that this can be itemised and it's not, you know, it's not a, a single delivery that, all, that will be experienced one day and not before that, but it can be broken down and delivered in various chunks as required to meet business needs and probably more importantly funding requirements at the same time. <clears throat> Are you seeing any parallels with the process that's been applied here compared to the previous uh, attempt to procure and deliver the I-6, because uh, we'd be, surely we'd be interested in whether your view is that we're, we're falling on the same pathway as we did previously. I think it's probably too early to say whether there are, there are parallels. What we would expect of SPA Police Scotland and, and any public body really is that they learn from previous challenges. Um, they're not yet at the procurement stage um, for this strategy, um, and that will be a, you know, a key part of the learning from, from the I-6 um, of old. Um, the main point that we make in the report in terms of the, the digital data and ICT strategy is that um, whilst the strategy itself is now in place, there remains uncertainty about how the strategy will be funded you know, and, and, um, and the extent to which the, the clarity for that needs to, uh, needs to come through, given the importance of this strategy. I mean, you've said the, the SPA have approved the strategy, and that's to be welcome. But will we see some more details about this, and how soon might we see the, the detail behind the, the whole strategy? We're planning um, a piece of work next year on um, digital transformation of public services, and one of the uh, programmes that we'll be likely looking at as part of that is this one, uh, partly because of its scale and importance and partly because of its history. Um, I think the preliminary view of our digital team is that this is a more um, realistic, a more measured approach to what's required and that the principles that we've set out for good management of IT programmes have been followed so far and it's cl clearly very early days. Um, I think the programme is available um, if the committee wants to explore it further, but we will be having a look at it as part of that performance audit next year. Okay, last question. Can you know, is there is there any sense at this stage? Do you know about post Brexit relationships with European police forces like Europol and so on in terms of the IT and communication and data sharing? Is there any semblance of that within the proposal or the strategies to how we'll take that forward? I think um, we're not cited through our work, Mr. Coffey, in terms of you know, what that means in terms of uh, European relationships. More generally, we know that there's been considerable planning within Police Scotland and the SPA on the potential scenarios and implications um, around Brexit, both around general business and, and policing operations and, and potential financial implications associated with it. Okay.
Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Angela Constance. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, the uh, Auditor General uh, noted um, fairly that on the, the, the one hand, uh, the SPA are, are making progress on um, issues previously uh, identified by Audit Scotland. There's been changes in leadership, strengthening uh, of governance, uh, the annual review of policing says there's a good level of service. So what I'm keen to establish is, um, are we building, are we now building on strong foundations? Um, given that there are uh, financial challenges, the Scottish Government continues to uh, pick up the, the, the deficit. So how far has this organisation still to go? Where would you put them between 1 to 10 if the journeys between Edinburgh and Glasgow have they reached Livingston yet? Um, I, I think it's certainly fair to say that we're seeing much stronger foundations for the change that needs to happen now than we've seen at any point since the SPA and Police Scotland were established back in 2013. Um, I put particular uh, focus on the leadership capacity that's been built in both organisations, um, the much stronger governance that's in place um, to make sure that important decisions are taken properly and well, um, which weren't always in place in the past, and an understanding of the overall um, vision for policing, Policing 2026, and some of the key things that underpin that, particularly the financial strategy and the IT strategy that we've been talking about. Um, I think there are two caveats. One, it's early days for all of that. We've really only seen new people in post over the last six months or so, um, and the um, teams, the relationships, the ways of working are all still um, forming and coming into place. Um, and secondly, the challenges themselves are really significant. Um, there's an exhibit in my report that shows the scale of the financial challenge over the next 10 years or so. That's significant. And reshaping policing in line with the vision 2026 is a very big job, would be for any police service, let alone one that's had the difficult start that Police Scotland has. Um, I'm not sure I want to give you a sort of geographical metaphor for where it might be, but I'm genuinely encouraged those foundations are much stronger and I don't underestimate the challenges that are still to come. OK, so to paraphrase, you're um, encouraged that a, a new chapter has been started. Yeah, um, when I was um, interviewed about the report when it was published, I said that Police Scotland and the SPA have turned a corner. I think that's a good way of putting it. They, they've had a very difficult birth, and I think they're now a much better place to do what they need to do. OK. Um, in terms of the 10-year financial strategy, um, I wonder if you could say a bit about that in terms of the forecasts and the assumptions that have been made. I mean, forecasts are just that, they're that they're forecasts. So I want to know uh, how uh, robust the assumptions and forecasts um, are. Um, and I'm also conscious that, you know, I don't think uh, anybody in the public sector, uh, let alone the government, know what their overall envelope is going to be, you know, between now um, and another uh, 10 years. So I'm keen to know um, how robust it is in terms of what we can reasonably expect to know right now um, and the processes for which that 10-year financial strategy will be reviewed. You're right that any forecast is only that. It's never going to be exactly right. It's, it should be a range of possibilities based on clear assumptions. Um, some public bodies use that uncertainty as a reason for not doing it. I think that's entirely the wrong response. I think the uncertainty is, is the most important reason for doing that, planning ahead. Um, and I genuinely welcome the fact that the SPA now has that 10-year strategy in place for the first time. Um, Stephen can give you a bit more detail in a moment about the um, assumptions that underlie it and what we think about the strength of it. Um, I just stress that the two gaps that I think um, need to be filled to give us as much confidence as we can have in it are the development of a proper workforce strategy and a state strategy, um, both big parts of the expenditure, big parts of the ability to change the way <coughs> policing is delivered, and there's not yet enough detail about those, I think, to be certain that the numbers are robust. Stephen. Thank you. Uh, good morning. You asked specifically about the assumptions. Um, we've come to that first of all. The key assumption that is made in um, in the financial plan is around a 2% increase um, in funding um, annually. Um, that feels like broadly in the right place for, for, for the organisation. Um, they've tested it internally, they've tested it through the work of the Finance Committee um, and the Board. Um, so I think from our sense, and, and having seen those um, those committees in operation since that, that was sufficiently uh, challenged in terms of uh, governance terms. Um, as the Auditor General mentions, the, the the key to the durability of the, the financial plan will be the extent of transformation that uh, the SPA is able to achieve. Um, 
in addition to that, they keep it under regular review um, as well. So at least six monthly, annually, there's a there's an ongoing review. And I think particularly given the um, the uncertainty that ex exists around the 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 potential uh, future availability of public funds uh, to uh, to the SPA, we think that's appropriate that they keep this under regular review as they go forward. Okay. Uh, and my final question, Convener, I'm, I'm very conscious um, that in, in your report you um, indicated that the financial strategy is underpinned uh, by a number of programmes of change, you know, whether that's, as you see, ICT, um, estates, uh, workforce. Um, and you describe these programmes of change as very complex. So I'm keen if you can give us an insight into how complex uh, they are, um, or is it just that there's a lot of programmes of change that are interrelated and it's more about volume than complexity? And how does the complexity compare to other parts of the public sector where you know there are many programmes um, of, of change, you know, setting up a, a new social security agency, you know, getting the right payments to the right folk uh, at the right time um, is complex. Um, and what learning, you know, will police Scotland uh, rest on from elsewhere? That given that things to do with workforce estates, ICT, uh, in many ways is a path. Uh, well trodden, um, you know. There's a great, um, very insightful report from the Institute of uh, Government uh, on the history of universal credit that is um, um, uh, valuable for reading uh, for anybody that's interested in managing programmes of change well. Um, in a Scottish government contact context, there's you know uh, trodden paths are down down NHS 24, you know cap futures etc. So, you know how complex are their programmes of change, um, and you know where are they going to learn from else? The, the, not to repeat, um, you know perhaps less than optimal experiences elsewhere in the public sector. It's a really good question, and it's not one that's got a, a short or easy answer, but I'll do my best, and colleagues may want to chip in. I think two things make this um, this programme particularly complex. One is that um, it is trying to bring together eight predecessor forces from around Scotland that existed just over five years ago into one service for the whole of Scotland, um, when for a period before the... Um, merger, the establishment of Police Scotland, um, there were very different ways of working, different levels of investment, um, different strengths in different parts of the country and different areas that um, weren't um, as good as they could be. Um, and bringing that together for a very strongly professionally led service, I think, was always going to be a challenge. And then looking beyond that, the, the, under, the underlying um, concept behind Policing 2026 is that what we all expect of policing in the 21st century is different from what we needed in the 20th century. So we've got much more in the way of cybercrime, for example. People tend not to go and rob banks with shotguns anymore. They, they rob bank accounts and financial transactions through computers and, and digital transactions. All of that requires different skills and a different way of policing. We've got um, a, a big surge in uh, historical sexual abuse, um, crimes, different expectations around harassment um, of different groups. All of that is changing what we expect of policing. And both of those need to happen at the same time against a context of tight finances um, and government policy, which in the past has focused very, uh, very clearly on the number of police officers as police officers rather than what policing as a whole can do. Now, the policy, I think, is seen as being the right way forward. But bringing all of that together um, with a budget of a billion pounds a year and m much more investment needed to get us to where we need to be was never going to be easy. Um, you mentioned Social Security Scotland. We've reported on that and found that actually that programme's being managed very well in terms of clarity about what's achieved, good risk management, good engagement with partners around the place. Again, still a way to go, but good starting points. The work we've done on digital has identified some really clear principles, um, and so far I'm encouraged that the approach to the new strategy in Police Scotland takes account of those principles. So I think there is learning going on and that doesn't make making change happen on this scale easy. It's always going to be difficult. Mm. Stephen, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, just very briefly, I think the complexity has increased because of the, the uh, very clear interconnections between the strategies in terms of the estates, workforce, and how that 
how those requirements may or may not change with whatever technology changes are introduced through digital data and, and ICT, such, such as the you know the type of staff required that the Auditor General mentioned, and then where you know, services will be provided from um, across Scotland. Um, so all of that, um, in, I guess, increases the scale of the, the, the challenge and the complexity. The one thing that we've seen with Police Scotland and, and the SPA that um, is in terms of the learning and access to other advice. Um, we know that they're in close contact with the Scottish Government and the Office of the Chief Information Officer to test the development of, um, of the strategy. We think that's an important part of their considerations. And are you confident that all the risks are identified, given that it's sometimes what we don't know that's the problem? Um, I don't think I could give you that categorical assurance that, you know, that all the risks um, are known. I think what's, what's very important is that it's closely monitored and, and kept under review, both by Police Scotland and the SPA, um, and then the assurance um, arrangements that they have in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, before I move on to workforce and workforce planning and things, can I just take you back to uh, Willie Coffey's line of question around the ICT strategy for me? Uh, in the report, you talk about the lack of clarity. Uh, what do you mean when you say in your report that there is there are risks to the future financial sustainability of the SPA if the ICT strategy is not fully funded? Um, the delivery of uh, policing 2026 um, st clearly states that it depends on investment to change the IT underpinnings of Police Scotland, the way that police officers, police staff are able to use IT to carry out their jobs day to day. Um, just as a wee example for police officers who are attending in an incident to be able to record the details where they are without having to go back to a police station to record them, for people in custody suites to be able to refer to that, for, for that to work all the way through the criminal justice system. And there are other linkages across the piece that, that all are necessary if the vision is, is able to be delivered, both in terms of the quality of policing that we all experience, but also the number of police officers and police staff who are required to do it. So the progress that's been made is that there is now this much clearer digital data and IT strategy for how that will be done, but there isn't, it's not clear yet where the 298 million estimated costs of that will come from. We understand that the Cabinet Secretary is due to address that as part of the Scottish Budget next week, um, or that future funding will be addressed, um, but if, if the investment that's required to deliver the IT strategy isn't available, then all of the um, planning about the vision and how it will be delivered will need to be revisited. Um, and that means that the costs that are currently being incurred continue with the trajectory that they currently have. And that gives you the graph that we've got in Exhibit 2, which takes you back into a deficit after 2020-21. Yeah, so presumably uh, the, the, the risk is that the SPA clears, it takes great steps to, to clear a significant deficit, uh, but then as part of this programme, uh, re-incurs it almost as a result of lack of funding at this end. Is that correct? Yeah, achieving um, financial sustainability and delivering the vision, more importantly, do depend on that investment to um, achieve an IT system which is quite different from what they've got at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the source of that funding isn't yet clear. And do you get any sense of, let's say, for example, in the next budget, the, the Scottish Government says, OK, we'll, we'll partially fund the £298 million. Uh, what happens then? Does, do the police uh, either make cuts elsewhere to cross-fund or do they cut the £298 million programme? I think that's more of a question for the government and the Scottish Police Authority than for us. Um, what I'm doing is highlighting the risk that um, without that investment, um, the financial sustainability of the SPA is, is um, significantly unclear, much more than it is at the moment. I understand. I think Willie Coffey would like to come in on this point. Yes, thanks, convener, again. It's a supplementary sure. to that. Uh, Caroline, in the report that you did in March 2017 about I6, there's a paragraph in here that says that over the 10-year period, we could expect efficiency savings of around £200 million. Is there any semblance of that uh, element within the new strategy and the new estimate, what the 10-year forecast for efficiency savings might be, to offset the concerns from the convener? I'll ask Stephen to pick that up, if I may. Thank you. Um, the scale of, of efficiency savings is captured in the digital data and ICT contract. We've not, official, we've not formally undertaken an audit um, of the strategy yet. Um, it's something that's um, absolutely clear in our plans for 18-19 uh, to assess, very, very importantly, the connections between the financial uh, strategy, the financial planning 
um, and the strategy itself and something we would catch in future reports. Is, is there a figure in there, though? Um, I would need to come back to the committee on that. OK. Uh, on this point, Alex Neil. Just a couple of factual questions. Uh, first of all, over what period of time it is, is it intended to implement the strategy for IT? Uh, and secondly, um, the funding, would that be on top of the existing capital Dell and the capital for the reform funding? Um, Stephen, probably best place to answer both of this. Um, I'll tell you the second question first, Mr Neil, for me. Um, the expectation is that it would be, yes, on top of the existing capital Dell uh, provisions. Um, and the, the delivery of the programme is predicated on the delivery of policing 2026. So that's mapped out over the, you know, the, the next six years of the, um, of the next decade to deliver the, um, the implementation um, of the strategy, the connections with the financial plan. And then, of course, I guess the, the other point that's, that's key to this is what that means for transformation in the round, about how that impacts upon workforce and estates. I think it's probably an, we have an expectation that all of these strategies, you know, once implemented, will have a considerable impact upon the financial projections um, of Police Scotland and SPA. That again, so the numbers that are, appear today, we expect will have to change again as, as time scales and yeah. funding uh, become clearer. And do you have any information on what potential methods of funding are being considered by the government? Is it SFT type, PDP type funding, or is it uh, using their own capital or a combination or whatever? So I, I, we don't have any uh, awareness of how that's planned to be uh, funded at this stage. Right. We understand that the SPA's request is, is that this is this they have commitment around the quantum of the of the capital required, as opposed to the vehicles that we use to to okay. uh, produce it. Thank you, Anna Sarwar. Uh, good morning. I, I wanted to focus just a, a bit around the specific around workforce. Um, obviously, the report makes clear that there's insufficient progress in developing a workforce strategy. Um, it also raises concerns about um, only monitoring headcount, need, a need for improved reporting, uh, more coordination required with stakeholders. I just wonder, Auditor General, if you can um, outline just some of the reasons why you think there has been a delay in developing a workforce strategy, and secondly, whether you have any idea of whether that stakeholder engagement um, has gone forward and made any progress since the report. Um, I, I think the first thing to say is that we recognise that workforce planning is absolutely central to doing this. Policing is a service that's, that's um, delivered through people, um, through police officers and police staff, working with partners across the public sector and the third sector every day. Um, most of the budget is spent on people um, and the way that we're planning for that, developing people for the future, thinking about how people are used is, is key to being able to deliver p policing. Um, there have been early steps in delivering a workforce strategy, but it's not yet detailed enough to underpin the sort of planning that Stephen's been outlining for the committee. Um, I think there are probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that, as Stephen said, all of the different elements of the strategies that underpin the vision are interdependent. Um, if you spend more on IT and get a system that's very flexible, you can probably deliver the same service with fewer people. Mm. Um, so those things work together. Um, and I think the um, SPA and Police Scotland have been working through with government the implications of the minimum number of police officers at 17, 2, 3, 4, the room for flexing that as it becomes clearer how policing can be delivered differently, um, for example, using uh, specialists in cyber security who may not be police officers but are very much involved in delivering policing. All of that's taken time. Um, and the um, changes that have been in the leadership teams of both the SPA and Police Scotland have also had an effect. Um, Stephen, I think, can give you a bit more of a sense of the way it's developing now and what the uh, priorities are. I think, I think one of the things I would maybe bring the committee's attention to is that you know, there has been some progress um, over the past year. I think one of the key steps that Police Scotland have identified to us is the harmonisation of, of police terms and conditions um, across the country. That has been a, felt like a significant milestone uh, for the organisation um, and, and the financial implications of that have been, are captured in, in the annual report and accounts. Um, not terribly much more to the point that the Auditor General makes, essentially is that we, they now have the platform, they now have the capability and capacity uh, to do so, but um, as ever with transformation, it's not one thing mm. um, in its own, it's the really inter interconnected nature mm. of the strategies and the knock-on implication of, of what transformation might mean for what's required from workforce, 
played off against the states and then uh, the timing and cost of, of technology progress as well. Has there been any assessment of the fact that we had eight police authorities down, down to one, whether there's been some geographical challenges in particular around workforce planning and workforce strategies? Um, and if so, where those geographical challenges are? Um, it's not something I think we, we're maybe close enough to, to brief the committee on um, in terms of what it means for the workforce. Um, clearly, as a national service, you know, they understand that you know, what's, um, what workforce requirements are in one area will not be the same as, as what they will be in another. Um, it's something that we keep a close eye on through, through our work and, and we'll report back to the committee um, as necessary. But alternatively, if it's something of particular interest, it may be worth exploring further with uh, SPA or Police Scotland. And the Auditor General made clear, quite rightly, around how crimes are changing, how the need for policing is changing. Um, is there any uh, analysis in terms of the, the workforce strategies that are in place or being developed that is looking at, one, what new skills are required in terms of recruitment? or indeed what level of retraining is required for the existing workforce to to modernise in terms of the kinds of crimes and policing that we are, we're dealing with today? I think that's exactly the sort of detail we'd expect to see in the workforce strategy that underpins the vision. The vision recognises those sorts of, sorts of changes very fully, recognises that it will need um, different types of police officers and police staff, potentially in different places. It's the detail beneath that that would let you actually start recruiting or training or doing the financial planning for that we don't yet have. Okay. And, and a general question just on workforce planning. If you look at all the audit Scotland reports around, for example, the National Health Service makes clear around workforce challenges. Um, around the Police Authority and Police Scotland makes clear around workforce challenges. Um, do we have a workforce planning issue in Scotland um, around, one, the strategies and how we pull them together? And secondly, if you look at the, the vacancy rates that we have and workforce planning issues we have across the country, a whole host of public services, surely there's a connection around we have a, a people problem. And what I mean by that is not our skills of our people, but actually the numbers of our people. We have so many vacancies in so many different areas. Do we have to be more realistic about what we can achieve and what we can get based upon our population and our ability to attract people, either train them quick enough in Scotland or attract them from other parts of the UK, the EU or, or, or abroad? Do we need to, as politicians, be much more alive about the people issue that we have? It's a really interesting question. I think in response to the first part of the question, I don't think what we need is a, a Scottish Public Services workforce plan that covers everything. I think that would be too well, high I a level and, yep. and probably wouldn't um, add anything useful to what we have got. Um, when we start to look at individual public services like health and care, like policing, the, the um, workforce planning that we do see tends to be quite supply-led. So in the NHS, we're tending to see people saying, um, we expect, uh, for example, I'm plucking numbers from the air, 20% of nurses to retire over the next 10 years. Therefore, we need to be recruiting and training this many nurses to fill the pipeline at the other end. In a world that's changing as fast as, as we are at the moment, where health and care is changing, we need to be thinking more about what work needs to be done mm. and how that's done, rather than thinking about sort of supply chains of professionals in isolation. Um, and I think um, there's room for us to be thinking about, in fact, I think we need to be doing that much more given the scale of uncertainty that's coming with the new financial powers, the um, volatility and the opportunities and risks that they bring with them, and obviously with the uncertainty around EU withdrawal as well. Mm. Um, I think there's room for all public services to be thinking um, more radically about how, how we use people to mm. deliver public services, both as public servants, as doctors and nurses, teachers, mm. police officers, and um, people themselves playing their part in all of that, along with the third sector. That's a huge question and beyond what we've got today. But I, think it's I, think, I think it's it's a really, really important area, though, because yeah. um, you're right around um, what roles and what different responsibilities people can have, um, what, what skills we have. An, an example of the National Health Service, you know, we're 3,500 nurses short. If you add the nurses, the midwives, the consultants, that alone, we need about 5,000 people in Scotland right now to, to try and make up just those vacancies. We simply won't find those people, and that's why a, a real... Do you think there needs to be a much stronger drive towards service reform? And not, I don't mean in a cuts or you know withdraw services. I mean in terms of a modernisation uh, programme that involves heavy investment around our IT infrastructure, around um, technology, and around better informing our citizens around what more they can do to support and be part of that public service in partnership with the third sector as well. 
does that reform agenda need to be much more in focus across all our public services in Scotland? I think I'd approach it from a different angle. Um, we've been thinking in Audit Scotland about the new Refresh National Performance Framework and the outcomes in there. Um, I've, I'm on record as saying I think the outcomes approach is a really good thing. I think it has mm -hmm. to be right to think about what you want to achieve with public services and public spending. And I think the new National Performance Framework is a great opportunity for saying, how do we go about improving those outcomes? And that almost certainly won't be in the traditional public services, the traditional roles that we've got. There's much more room to be thinking way upstream about um, prevention. Um, colleagues and I from Audit Scotland spent some time yesterday with the Wheatley Group thinking about hearing about how housing officers can meet the needs of their customers in the properties that they manage in much more flexible ways working with other public bodies. That's just one example of how we can think more flexibly about what, what prevention means and how we can improve mm. outcomes that move us on from the way public services have worked in the past. Uh, and I suppose the final question just in that is, do you think there's an acceptance of, of that point from from government, from political parties across the board, from public services themselves, and if so, one one is an acceptance, and second, is there a is there a programme that you see to deliver that? Do you think that plan or strategy exists? I think the. Um the commitment to the uh, National Performance Framework, its establishment in legislation now, both demonstrate that that approach is accepted across the board in this Parliament. I think what we haven't seen yet is, is the detailed hard work of thinking, so what does that mean for how we um, change the way we work? with a full recognition that that's hard to do at a time when public services are under pressure because of both rising demand and really tight financial pressures. But we're in that catch-22 situation, I think, where the solution to those pressures is to make that time mm. and step back and think how we do things differently. And unless we can break that cycle of running to keep up, we won't be able to do it. Yeah. And I was just going to ask about the British Transport Police. Before we'll come back to it. Like yeah, no, so I'll just... Because uh, it's a really interesting line of questioning. Can I... Um, Quickly ask about the Chief Executive post. Uh, Auditor General, you recall, uh, last summer the former Chief Executive was made redundant uh, on a justification that the role had, had shrunk uh, and therefore there was a redundancy situation. There was an interim Chief Executive came in on a lower salary, which stacks up if the role had been uh, smaller. Uh, my understanding is that the new Chief Executive, I think, came in in August, yes. uh, is back on the original salary, uh, which seems rather strange to me. Uh, so is it the case that the chief executive role has now re-expanded to what it was before? Uh, and if not, why are we paying more? Uh, and in any event, the, the Scottish government, I think, signed off on this. So. Uh, do you have any oversight on the Scottish Government's thinking uh, in this regard? You're absolutely right that the um, justification for making the former Chief Executive redundant was um, a reduction in the size of the role due to the um, removal of forensic services from his reporting responsibilities. Um, and that was part of the business case which enabled um, a redundancy situation to occur um, and a settlement to be um, reached with the former post holder. Um, the new um, chair of the board um, and the um, refreshed board that's in place since then has reviewed what support the SPA needs in terms of its chief executive um, capacity and the system that goes with that. Um, the factual position is that the forensic reporting lines remain outside um, the chief executive, the new chief executive's role, um, but the SPA. Um, uh, evaluated the role and fixed a salary for it, which is commensurate with that paid to the previous chief executive. And both of those sets of decisions were agreed with the Scottish Government. So just to clarify, just to reflect that back, there was a redundancy situation, a smaller role, which merited a smaller remuneration. Uh, but it has now been decided that that smaller role merits the, the increase, the, the larger salary that was in place before. Is that correct? That's a, that's a factually correct description of the situation. Um, I think it's fair for me to say that my concern is not a... 
My concern is not about the salary that's being paid to the um, current chief executive. I think it's a very significant job with significant responsibilities as accountable officer for more than a billion pounds worth of public money. Mm -hmm. um, I think my concerns are about the decision-making process which um, was taking place around the uh, former chief executive, which I reported to the committee last year. Mm -hmm. Are you able to provide us with any more detail on the current arrangements? Just to, The committee has obviously been very concerned. Uh, about similar sort of situations uh, and if you were able to give us more detail uh, after this session I think we'd appreciate it. Would that be possible? Um, I, I'm not sure there's very much we can add to what I've said now. I, I think my concern as I say was about the options considered by um, the chair of the board and the board generally um, in 2017 around the departure of the previous chief executive um, and I reported that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the um, remuneration for the uh, current chief executive um, has been agreed with the Scottish Government after a proper process um, and it doesn't seem to me disproportionate for a job of this scale. Stephen, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Can Alex. I just come in on this because I'm not clear what the you know, additional responsibilities this new chief executive has as forensics is still out with it. Uh, I, I realise this, this is not your primary responsibility. Can I suggest, convener, that we write to the chair of the board asking for more detail as to why this was agreed? Because this committee was very, very clear last year that we thought that the chief executive's position was well overpaid and could we include a request for to confirm what the actual salary of the new chief executive is mm -hmm. uh, and why the public audit committee's recommendations in this were ignored. I think that would be very sensible. Let's talk about that later. Shall There's we? no point in us making decisions and then having them ignored by quangles. Indeed. Uh, you had some further questions, Alex, or shall I move to BTP? Uh, don't move to... Anna Sauer. You, you mentioned Order General in, in your um, opening remarks around uh, BTP and the impact that could have on the um, policing strategy 2026. Um, do you have any sense on, on, on whether that delay will have an impact and if so, what that impact might be? And obviously the Parliament is very divided on, on uh, the British Transport Police um, and the integration with Police Scotland. Um, any view, it might be, might be a, a more a political situation than, than one for yourselves, but it, it, is the delay in making a decision part of the problem? If, if we just had a decision either way to, to either have the integration or not have the integration, um, would, would that in, in impact on, on that strategy? Just, just your views and thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. It's not my role to comment on policy decisions. That's a matter for government and for, for this parliament. Um, and I recognise that the Smith Commission agreed the devolution of policing to Scotland. Um, we now have legislation in place to, to give effect to that. Um, I think it became clear during the process of considering how that might happen that it was more complicated and potentially much more costly than was originally expected. And the cabinet secretary has announced that he's reviewing the options that are available. Um, I think um, the concern that I express in here is more that the um, level of change which the SPA and Police Scotland need to manage in any case is very significant and the uh, continuing uncertainty about how the devolution of transport policing might happen is another element of uncertainty that adds to the things the committee has already been discussing this and, morning. And is that uncertainty a workforce uncertainty, a financial uncertainty, um, a service delivery? Um, uncertainty or, or all three? I think it's all of the above and I think probably above all it has the potential to distract the capacity of the leaders of the SPA and of Police Scotland from the things they need to be doing to, to transform policing while still thinking about um, what might be required to devolve transport policing as well. And final question, what, what actions or steps do you think are required to avoid that situation? So what are you recommending? Um, I think the um, best outcome would be an early decision about the way forward and a decision which takes account of the capacity within the SPA and Police Scotland to make further changes. And a, a lack of an early decision or a delayed decision will mean workforce challenges, service delivery challenges and financial challenges? No, I say in the report um, quite carefully that there is a risk that those things happen, but I think while the question is still open, it, it does inevitably distract some um, attention, some focus from the things that we know need to happen, whatever decision is taken about transport policing. Thank you.
Thank you. Just staying with that, it's an important point. Um, in your report, you say there is a risk that the ongoing uncertainty continues to absorb resources at the expense of wider strategic observers, uh, objectives. Do you, can you specify what resources are actually being tied up by this uncertainty at the moment? And uh, perhaps from that, notwithstanding a decision, how long do you consider that that could continue? I think we're probably currently in a position where it's taking less time and attention than it was before the Cabinet Secretary's announcement earlier in the year. I'll ask Pauline to talk you through what, what we saw through the audit as being the consequences of it until that point. Pauline. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, our, our concern is mainly around the mm. amount of staff time mm. and energy and leadership time that has been spent on the project to date. Um, and until there's clarity about what the future plans are and the timescales of those, we're concerned that that continues in the future. Um, the organisation is obviously in a period of great transformation, um, lots of projects underway, and our concern is that uh, attention has been diverted away from those projects onto this. So effectively, until there's a decision, like Mr Sarwar says, there will be a cost in terms of the human resource that is required, uh, because even though we've postponed the decision, there's still presumably something going on, and then that has a cost attached as well uh, to the detriment of other projects. Is that correct? Yes, SPA and Police Scotland staff are still engaging with BTP um, and the Scottish Government on future plans, so there is there is still some time, um, staff time that's been expended on the project. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the just to move on a topic slightly, the your report expresses concern about the performance management arrangements and says that there's it's vital that uh, uh, improvements are made in order for the SPA to hold Police Scotland to account uh, sufficiently. Uh, What's your view on that? Are, are sufficient steps being taken uh, to, to get a new performance management process in, in place? And is that being done with sufficient urgency, in your view? Um, I'll start by restating that I do think it's critical. Um, we've heard over the last five years um, a range of views about SPA's role as in holding Police Scotland to account. I think those views are now much more widely understood, the roles are, um, and I think the new teams in um, the SPA and Police Scotland are working much better together to make that happen in practice. But it can't happen as envisaged in the legislation unless the SPA has the information it needs about how well policing is performing and the current performance framework isn't good enough to support that. Um, there is work that's underway, um, but it's not progressing fast enough to mean that the SPA can now sit down at, at its public board meetings and demonstrate um, that it's holding uh, Police Scotland to account for the delivery of policing right across Scotland. Stephen, do you want to say a bit more about what you see of that? Um, I think d just briefly, in addition to that, I think um, both the SPA and Police Scotland are very clear that this is a key priority um, for, for the short term. Um, as the report mentioned, it undermines the SPA's ability to discharge its responsibilities in holding Police Scotland to account, given the, the, the depth and the extent of the performance management arrangements that are currently in place. The plans, um, the, 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 new, the new Chief Executive of the SPA has this very clearly in his focus um, as, a, as one of his first targets. What he's keen to do is to expand the range of sources that SPA is considering and taking a, a wider view of the performance of policing in Scotland. To date, that's largely focused on information derived from Police Scotland systems provided to the SPA to take a, to take a view on. What his plan is to broaden that out to consider academic research and so forth to take a, a wider assessment. And back to the point that the Auditor General makes about um, not just about you know, the numbers that are presented to them, but, it's, but importantly, what the outcomes that are being achieved for the, the large scale of public expenditure in this area. Uh, thank you. Just to go back to the Auditor General's point, though, you, you said, Auditor General, it's not progressing fast enough. So on whom is the onus to uh, expedite this process? Um, I think, as Stephen said, the new Chief Executive is very much focused on this. Um, he has been in post uh, since October. Um, so it's very early days for um, him to be uh, demonstrating progress with it. And it's something that hadn't made enough progress at all um, in the first five years of Police Scotland SPA's um, existence. Uh, so in terms of the new teams, it's very early days. It, it's now five years since uh, the SPA and Police Scotland were established. And because of its importance, I think it needs to progress as quickly as it can at this point. 
I'm very grateful. Do members have any further questions on this topic? No, in which case I'd like to thank the Auditor General and team for their evidence this morning and I'll suspend uh, until 10 o'clock uh, for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome back to the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. Uh, item 3 on our agenda this morning is a Section 22 report on the 2017-18 Audit of Community Justice Scotland. I'd like to welcome our witnesses for the next item on our agenda this morning. Uh, Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Roberts, Senior Manager of Audit Scotland, and Jill Brown, Director of Grant Thornton. Again, I'd like to invite the Auditor General to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This brief report results from the first annual audit of Community Justice Scotland, a small central government body which began work on the 1st of April 2017. It's critical to the Scottish Government's justice strategy and its ambition to shift the balance away from custodial sentences toward more community-based sentences. It spent £1.2 million in its first year and the auditor gave an unqualified opinion on the annual report and accounts. Community Justice Scotland started work with a board consisting of a chair and four members appointed by Scottish ministers. This makeup didn't comply with the Community Justice Scotland Act 2016, which specifies a minimum of five members in addition to the chair. Between October 2017 and October 2018, the chair of the board was absent. Three of the remaining four non-executive directors agreed to take turns to chair board meetings until April 2018, when the board agreed to appoint one of its members to be interim chair. The Scottish Government subsequently approved this arrangement. During 2017-18, the board's Audit and Risk Committee met just twice, and its Human Resources and Remuneration Committee didn't meet at all. The chair resigned in November this year, and the Scottish Government is planning to recruit a new chair. In addition, the Government appointed four new members to the Board in October, bringing the total number to eight, one of whom is currently acting as Interim Chair. Convener, effective governance is critical to the work of all public bodies, irrespective of their size. We will monitor, monitor Community Justice Scotland's progress through the 2018-19 audit, and my performance audit programme contains a proposal to look at community justice in 2020-21. I'm accompanied by Joanne Brown, who is uh, the appointed auditor for Community Justice Scotland, and Mark Roberts from Audit Scotland, and we'll do our best together to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much. We'll start with Anna Sawa. Yeah, good morning again. Um, obviously, a, clear, a key part of the report is around the uh, number of members of the, of the board. Um, have you had any explanation from the government about why it didn't appoint the appropriate number of people right at the start of the... Um, process, um, what the barriers were, what the what the challenges were, um, any explanation at all? Mark, can I ask you to pick that one up? Thank you. The um, our understanding was that sort of given that sort of it was very in the, the very early stages of um, Community Justice Scotland discussions were had between the organisation and Scottish Government about what, how many board members it it, it needed. Um, I'm afraid I'm still not clear as, as to why um, it was a chair plus five non-executive members as opposed to that which was specified um, within the Act. Um, there were discussions that a small number of board members were appropriate uh, to the early stages, um, but in terms of the actual, actual number, I think that question would be better directed to the Scottish Government. Uh, uh, and what are, the, what, are the, what are the sanctions on, on government or challenges in government if it doesn't comply with an Act of Parliament? I think that's part of the role of Parliament it's, and its committees to think what's appropriate in individual circumstances. Um, it's my role to bring it to your attention that, in this case, um, the size of the board didn't comply with the legislation approved by Parliament. Um, and as far as the, the board is concerned, either at the early stages or, or where it is now, <coughs> I suppose a much bigger consideration for me is, is not whether we've got the right numbers of people on the board, but whether we've got the right skills on the board. Um, did we have the right skills on the board at the outset, when we had the one plus four, do we have the right set of skills on the board now? Um, I think our view is that the um, appointment of the new members is a really important opportunity to broaden the skills and make sure that they are what the organisation means. Jo, I think you might want to comment on that. Yeah, one of the things they're looking at just now, now they've got the additional four non-executive members, is to undertake a skills matrix to look at the skills of that board and identify where there may be potential areas of gaps or areas where training is required. From speaking to the accountable officer, for example, there's plans in place to do training for the members of the audit committee to strengthen their understanding and how they discharge their role in the audit committee. And that's something we'll look at as part of the 1819 external audit. So, so who was the chair and who is the chair now? 
the, um, there, there currently isn't a chair. The chair resigned in October 2018, and the government hasn't yet, I think, advertised for a new chair. Um, the uh, chair for the first um, period of the organisation's existence was uh, Jean Cooper. How often does the board now meet, and do they draw lots about who chairs the meetings? Um, Joan, you can pick that up in terms of frequency. So, so just as well, just to clarify, in that transition period where the chair was absent, um, the three of the non-executive members rotated that chair. A decision was taken in, in April 18 when the position around the, the chair at the time became a bit clearer that they would appoint an interim chair, and that was Glynis Watt, and Glynis continues to act in the interim chair of the board capacity. So she chairs the board meetings. As a relatively new organisation, they made the decision to meet monthly. That's something as a board they're continuing to look at. I think in terms of frequency, they're now meeting 10 times over the 12 months of the year. And that's something, again, they continue to look at and think about the business that is therefore going to the board and the amount of decisions that need to be taken by the board and whether that is appropriate. Uh, can you say just a bit about the makeup of the, the current board now in terms of its diversity and skills base and whether it is accurately reflective of the skills that are required of such a board and also of the diverse makeup of, of Scotland? So I suppose just in terms of commenting around the, the skills that are now on that board, what we can see is the external auditors, there's a very strong focus of experience on that board related to community justice and the community justice background in the arena. The four new appointments that were made in October 18 strengthen that community justice knowledge and experience mm. of the board. They all have um, relatively differing experience of working across public sector organisations, not-for-profit third sector organisations, and within that they've got a diverse experience around that. One of the things which we'll continue to look at from an 18-19 perspective is the sort of the financial understanding of the board, so how financial management is taken into <coughs> account as a skill set within the board, and the wider governance experience of the board, and that's something that should come through the skills matrix and be picked up as part of the training. Uh, two final questions to you, sorry. One, uh, what is, is there gender balance on the board, and is there any ethnic minority representation on the eight-member board? In terms of gender balance, um, the four new appointments were male. However, the, a number of the non-execs previously were female, so I think it's just shy of the 50-50 in terms of gender balance, but I couldn't comment on terms of wider diversity, but I'm sure we could get that, that information. That, that, that'd be great. And, and final question, given the, the fact that we had one chair and four board members and didn't comply with the Act um, for a large part of well, for almost all of its existence, uh, given the fact that we don't currently have a chair, it doesn't seem like this has got a great deal of government oversight or interest. Was this just a was just this a creation of a body because it, it sounded like the right thing to do? do? Do you get a sense that this is a strategic priority for the government and they're investing the time and energy that is needed to make it a success? I think community justice for Scotland is a priority, um, and I think that. Um, the, the board needs to be playing a really important role as it moves into the second year of its life in um, making that change happen. Um, I think uh, Mark can give you a better sense of the oversight that government was exercising during this period. Um, government um, officials were, were represented at um, a number of the board meetings throughout the course of the year that they, they were aware that of the, the process of, of establishing the organisation prior to April 2017 and how it was operating um, subsequent to that. So I think there was, was a, a, a reasonable level of, of government awareness as to how the board was operating during the course of the year. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll pick up that question and come at it from a slightly different angle. If the board is appointed by the Scottish ministers, there's no chair, there's no deputy, and uh, for at least some of this existence, there has been, it's been a very small board appointed by the Scottish Government. Uh, some people watching might wonder if it's understandable that the Scottish Government in, isn't in a tearing hurry to uh, find more people to be on this board on the basis that uh, they have greater control over it in this way. I, I don't think that was our conclusion at all. Um, I think... Um, I, 
it's important to remind ourselves that um, when the chair was first absent, nobody on the board or in government knew how long that absence would last. With hindsight, we know it lasted for 12 months from October 2017 to 2018. Um, but when uh, she was first absent, that was an open-ended process with no, no end sight, um, no end point in sight. Um, as uh, Joe has said, the board members for the first period rotated the chair between the other members and then um, after six months agreed to appoint one of their members as the interim chair. Um, I think by the end of the 12 months, um, it was an appropriate question uh, to ask about um, whether the arrangements in place were operating as effectively as they needed to be, um, and government has now appointed an additional four members. The uh, chair resigned and the government is uh, planning to appoint a new chair. Um, I think my concern is the um, effect on the basic governance arrangements for this new body, um, a broader question about the extent to which there is a cons consistent approach to setting up new bodies, which even for small ones isn't a trivial task to work through, and the opportunity cost for making sure that this body can play its really important role um, in delivering more community justice services and more effective services across Scotland. Thank you. A supplemental on this from Alex Neil. Can I can I ask Auditor General if this body and this board was abolished at five o'clock this afternoon, would anybody in Scotland actually notice? I think that's not entirely a fair question for a brand new body. It's certainly the case that it hasn't yet been able to establish itself to carry out the important function that it's got. I hope that when it's up and running and carrying out that function, it will be, as, as the government and parliament envisaged when they established it, a key part of community but justice. And there's it, an opportunity cost to not being there yet. But it's now been up and running for a year and three quarters. What has it achieved in that period? Um, its achievements have been focused very much on getting itself established. And as I've reported to this committee today, that's taken longer than it should have done. They haven't entirely been successful in doing that, have they? which is why my reports are in front of the committee today. Are there not a number of lessons in here? I mean, one of the obvious lessons I would have thought is that um, boards should appoint a deputy chair because if, through illness or whatever, a chair has to be absent for whatever length of time, you then have a deputy chair who can step in. And to allow members to rotate the chair, I mean, is not, I would have thought, good governance in itself, uh, apart from the lack of consistency you get. And obviously, um, uh, you don't know if the right people are, are, have got the skills to chair a board meeting. And the other thing that strikes me is that they did, they're doing the matrix of skills now. Surely you look at the skills as you appoint people to the board, not after you've appointed them. I mean, once you've appointed them, you're landed with the set of skills you've got, whether it's the right set of skills or not. Surely you actually do that before you make the appointment. You're absolutely right. There are lessons to be learned, and that's one of the reasons I report to this committee. Um, I think the first one is that appointments need to comply with the legislation that sets up the, the, bo the body, which didn't happen in this case. Um, I think, as the committee has just discussed before, there is real merit in having a deputy chair who can step in when required um, and can play that important role um, where, for example, there are differences within the board um, in helping them to resolve that and, and move forward. Um, and I think being clear about the making up of the board, both in terms of the skills that are required and the compliance with things like the government's um, diversity legislation and its policies are all important things. This is a small body which potentially plays an important part in the justice system in Scotland, um, and I've reported to the committee because I think it's important those lessons are learned. I think there's lots of lessons in here, and I think this is something obviously we need to discuss later, but I think we need to follow up on this. I mean, this is shambolic. Angela Constance. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, so, given that uh, this actually is a very important uh, public body, and I speak here as a former prison social worker, and given that in our earlier session we spoke of the importance of public sector reform and the reason d'etre of this particular organisation is to shift the balance from short-term custodial sentences that are costly uh, and ineffective into robust community disposals that will actually rehabilitate offenders and make our communities safer. So this is an important organisation. 
Um, and we also know from um, experience that the, the early years <laughs> in any organisation is crucial in terms of getting the right start, the best start, and those uh, strong uh, foundations um, being laid. So it is, if I've uh, uh, picked the panel up correctly, um, deeply concerning and regrettable that this organisation has been without a chair for one year. That is a long time for any organisation even if it was a well-established organisation, never mind a new one. Now, I don't want to, um, you know, I'm not expecting you to breach any personal information about any of the individuals involved, but I would be interested to know the impact on people taking turns to chair a meeting, given Alec Neil uh, issues about consistency. And also, is there anything that could have been done earlier um, to resolve this situation and how proactively involved are the sponsorship team? Lots of questions in there, and I'll ask Mark um, to uh, pick up the question. I think the, the broader point you're making, Ms Constance, is the one that I'd agree with, that it's really important that a public body that's set up to um, fulfil a major policy priority for the government has got that fair wind and support behind it. It's not a trivial matter to set up a new public body, and it needs to be done in the way that gives it the best chance of fulfilling its objectives. Mark. Thank you. Just, just to pick up on the... Um the situation of, of for a deputy chair, the Act makes, as we say in the report, um, explicit provision that a deputy chair can be appointed. Mm. The board explicitly decided not to do that during its early, early stages of work. In terms of the role of the um, sponsoring part of the, the, the Scottish Government, as I said um, previously in my answer to, to Mr Sawa, um, I think sponsoring team were were fairly actively involved in seeing how work was going on, were attending board meetings um, and, and so forth. So I think there, there was understanding and oversight of what was going on. Um, certainly um, in recent months in terms of the expansion in the number of board members, there's been um, a large amount of um, engagement between CJS and the sponsoring part of the Scottish Government. Um, so I think that has, has that it is there, it is very much seen as a priority for Scottish Government policy. Okay, I mean, I suspect there's probably questions that a uh, committee will want to follow up with the um, accountable officers within the organisation and within the sponsorship team. Um, and I also wanted to pick up on Anna Sarwar's point that diversity is strength. Um, there is uh, oodles of evidence uh, that gender balance and wider diversity isn't just the right thing to do, it's actually the smart thing to do to tap into uh, all the talents that are available. So given that uh, we have legislation, the Gender Representation uh, Public Board Scotland, uh, that has uh, passed through this Parliament, um, I think it has to be fully implemented by the, the, the early 2020s. Um, what assurance uh, can this committee seek that the law in this instance will actually be uh, complied with? And if uh, the four new appointees were all men, um, does that mean all the existing uh, appointees were women or are women? I think Joe said um, that um, a number of the, the previous board members are women um, and the chair who's resigned was a woman. Um, we don't yet know who the new chair will be, um, so that, that balance is not yet fixed. But I think your wider point is a really important one. How does the government make sure that the intentions that were enshrined in the legislation are um, being given effect to as appointments are being made um, to make sure that um, we are getting the right people on boards and that 50% of those board members are women by the target date in the legislation. Okay. And my final question, con convener, is that uh, given that there's an under-representation of women uh, who take up the positions of chairs uh, in uh, these, these public bodies, um, I wonder if the panel have uh, had any insight or assurance uh, to uh, the efforts that are being made to um, engage um, our community in the uh, widest sense about you know, encouraging applicants from women or from um, a BME background or, or, or people with um, a, a, a disability. And also, if you could give some sense more broadly about what are the, the, the top three priorities for this organisation over the next 12 months. On the first question, we haven't yet looked directly at the measures the government's taking to encourage um, 
more diverse applicants for board membership and board chairs um, in general. Um, this is an example of where there's an opportunity to do that, but we haven't looked at it, so I can't give you that assurance, and the committee may want to explore it with government. In terms of the priorities for this board, I, I think for me that the, the starting point is to establish the basics of good governance, to have a board that complies with the legislation, to have a chair in place, and to come together around what their priorities are, um, and then to start the important work of um, working with their partners around the uh, justice system and with wider stakeholders um, to make a reality of that policy commitment, commitment that you started your questioning with. Um, it's a really important part of public service reform. All the evidence suggests that it is both better for Scotland and better value for money, um, which is why this board is such an important part of the um, process of doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I move on, I, just briefly, has the the way the board has been constituted uh, impacted on its services, as far as you're aware, over the last year, 18 months? 2017-18 was always going to be um, the, the first year of it um, starting its operations, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, in my view, there probably is an opportunity cost in slowing down its ability to move into the next stage of actually starting to have an impact on justice services. Hard to quantify that, but I think it's hard to see how it, these um, problems could not have had that effect. Thank you. Alex Neil. Before I just go into financial capacity, which is the main thrust of my next question, I mean, I think we're all signed up absolutely to the objective. There's no doubt about that. But that's what makes this a greater tragedy, because by now we would have expected this board to be really, you know, on well uh, racing ahead because of the urgency and the priority that's been given to this policy. And it worries me that, you know, and I think it's a sensible suggestion, we need to slow down a bit to get it into shape before we move to the, the next phase, as it were. C can I just ask, before I go into financial capacity, just to confirm, uh, the chair, the, ex the, the current chair, resigned three months ago? October 2018. Right. Mm -hmm. And the job still hasn't been advertised. Mark checked in with government very recently. Um, I've, it's certainly not been placed on the Scottish government's appointed for Scotland website, where most public appointments are placed. Right, and coupled with Angela's point about deliberately trying to get, use the appointment of a chair to improve the diversity of the board, uh, I think it's something maybe we want to raise directly with the government about treating this a bit more urgently, given the importance uh, of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, in terms of financial capacity, which is um, an, another internal issue, um, are you satisfied that the board now has internally the financial capacity it requires to do the job when it's itself fully up and running? I'll ask Jo to pick that question up for you. Yeah, as, a, as an organisation, it's, it's very small. As the report sets out, there's only 26 employees. It is something we're going to look very closely at as part of our 18-19 audit and I know the accountable officer continues ha to have a number of conversations with Scottish Government and the sponsor department. They do make use of the Scottish Government finance systems, they make use of the payroll and financial ledger. However, she does recognise that the financial capacity and capability within our team at the moment is limited out with that Scottish Government arrangement and she has got a post that she's looking to recruit to strengthen her financial team. But that, again, is something we'll look at as part of 1819. Right. But uh, is there not also a lesson in here? I mean, last last week we heard about IGBs and the fact that, you know, some of them don't have a full-time financial officer and they're dealing with hundreds, if in some cases, potentially over a billion pounds a year. Um, is there a lesson in, in here about numerically small organisations uh, maybe having to share a central financial resource, for example, so they can get the level of expertise they require without having to build in a huge overhead that might not be justifiable for the size of organisation? Do we not need to be a bit more imaginative about how we address these issues? Jo may want to come in in a moment. I think my, my sense is that it's horses for courses. So what we've seen with this body is that it is um, it has a service level agreement with the Scottish Government to, to prepare yes. its financial accounts. It uses the Scottish Government's central finance systems like SEAS. Um, and at this stage, that's entirely appropriate. I think you're right. I think as it develops and plays more of a role, perhaps like um, the IJBs, of working with um, the Scottish Prison Service, with local authority, community justice services, with others to be changing the way in which um, 
sentencing works, then its scale and the complexity of what it needs to manage will also change. And it would be appropriate then to review what capacity it needs itself, not to do the transactions processing, but to really yeah. do the str yeah. strategic financial management about how funds need to flow through the system and how they may, may need to move from one place to another to make that change yeah. happen. And, and can I ask more generally, I mean, does the board have a bus has it agreed a business plan? Has it agreed its own strategy? You know, has it agreed it's, it knows its general outcomes, but has it agreed a performance monitoring system for its own added value in the system? Sure. Yeah, so in terms of its strategic priorities and setting its strategy, that is set out in a document that is, is agreed. And there is effectively a one-year financial plan which supports a business plan. They are working at looking at that over the next three years, recognising that from 1819, there will be a larger budget for Community Justice Scotland and it will start doing more commissioning. So it is looking at creating a wider three-year financial plan. And, and when, then, when will that be ready? That is something that they're looking at just now and they've committed to having in place when they're looking at the budget for 1920, so February 19 is the time scale they're working to. And they've got a broad, um, as part of their strategy, they've got a broad outline around the outcomes they want to achieve and they're starting to look at the performance management framework and how they report against those outcomes. But as you would expect for a relatively new organisation, a number of these areas are still in development. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Just to follow up on that, when you say that they use the Scottish Government systems, are they just if you like, inputting to a computer system, or is there someone in the Scottish Government who is responsible, who is the accountant, who prepares the accounts, understands what community justice does, um, you know, understands the business when putting together the financials? So I think it's probably a combination of both. So they have, um, they have a team within Community Justice Scotland that can input directly into the financial ledger and can uh, process transactions. In terms of the financial statement support, for the 1718 audit, those were prepared by somebody within the finance team of Scottish Government who were understanding the accounting transactions of CGS. They prepared the set of accounts. They then also liaised with us from an audit perspective around the underlying supporting information for those transactions. So when you signed off the accounts, did you, or you in the process of doing that, did you deal with somebody at the Community Justice? Did you deal with somebody at Scottish Government? Who, who took responsibility for the financials? So in terms of our facilitation, it was with somebody within Community Justice Scotland. However, when we were doing our audit work, there were wider questions around the financial statements and how they were prepared and how the accounting treatment for certain aspects were picked up. We liaised with Community Justice Scotland, but ultimately spoke to somebody within the Scottish Government finance team around the accounting and the, the preparation of the financial statements. It's, thank you. So at the moment, there's a gap within Community Justice and understanding the financials. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to move on, Willie, are you st you're coming in. Are you on that topic? No, just uh, so an audit. Uh, just very briefly, then, if I may, following on from that, the the annual audit report uh, says there was a lack of clarity at the audit and risk committee in July because no one from the Scottish government, who I think had prepared the accounts, turned up to talk about the accounts. Uh, why was that? Why did the Scottish government not show up? I think from that perspective, there was a a misunderstanding between Community Justice Scotland and the, the individual within the finance team at Scottish Government around the preparation of the accounts. Generally, one of the challenges they've had as an organisation is understanding the role and remit of the Audit and Risk Committee, but also of the individuals that attend the Audit and Risk Committee. So there was a misunderstanding that as their external auditors, I was preparing and presenting their financial statements rather than auditing their financial statements. And as part of that misunderstanding, there was nobody at that meeting to present the accounts. That's something they weren't aware of and they've learned from, and I would expect to see that much improved in 1819. Thank you. Willie Coffey. It was really the same area, convenient. It was about the Audit and Risk Committee. You say that it met twice in 1718. Is it? Is it? meeting at the moment? And do they have an internal audit programme and plan in place and has that been carried through? So they, they've got an internal audit programme. The internal audit is provided by the Scottish Government Internal Audit Service. They have an annual plan for 1819. As an audit and risk committee, 
They met in July. They've just recently met at the start of November, and the next meeting is scheduled for early January. So they have started to do a forward schedule. They just need to continue to project that through and, and agree effectively what the schedule of business for that audit and risk committee going forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do members have any further questions? No, in which case, thank you very much to the Auditor General and colleagues uh, for evidence this morning. And I now close the public part of this meeting as we move into private session. <laughs>